Ladies and gentle hackers, welcome to this first episode of Haskell Steps, a series in which we try to get more comfortable with the Haskell language. You may have heard of this language, Haskell, and you have you got interested in it. That's probably why you clicked this video. But you only have experience with uh, languages like uh, Python, C Sharp, C, C++, Java, JavaScript, um, the classical languages. And um, those la languages are called imperative languages because uh, when you write a program in them, you tell the computer exactly which, which steps to execute and in what, what order in order to get to the result. Um, Haskell, on the other hand, is a declarative language, which means that you declare or define what a solution looks like so that the compiler can determine uh, how to solve a problem that you give it. Um, for instance, when you want to calculate the sum of numbers in a list, or the sum of a list of numbers, uh, in an imperative language you would say, uh, assume that the result is zero, then for each uh, number in this list, add that number to the result, and finally give me the result. In Haskell you would say something more along the lines of, um, the sum of an empty list is zero, and the sum of a non-empty list is the first number of that list plus the sum of the rest of the list. So then you uh, define it recursively and you say, hey, if I know how to calculate a smaller list, I can calculate the sum of a smaller list plus one number by just adding that to the sum of the smaller list. Um, well, that is something you see very often in uh, functional and in declarative languages. You define the solution uh, in, by means of calculating the solution of a subproblem of itself. Um, when you think about it, uh, the way both solutions work, the imperative and the declarative, they are not so much different uh, in this case. But when um, using uh, larger programs, uh, writing solutions in uh, the functional way makes it easier to uh, focus on the function at hand and then compose it with different functions. Because when you do it in um, uh, imperative languages and object-oriented languages, it's, uh, uh, you also have to think about in what order those functions have been called. Um, and you uh, have to juggle in the surroundings, uh, the environment. And uh, I will show you the difference in a later episode. But let's uh, get comfortable with Haskell. Um, I will not um, show you how to install GHC in this episode. Uh, there are tutorials and guides on the web um, how to do it for your system. Um, I will put some uh, uh, links in the description. Uh, we will just look at some code, what it looks like, what the syntax looks like, and uh, how you can call functions and stuff. Let me get my screen here. Um, so um, I opened a file here called one.hs, and .hs is the extension for Haskell fi uh, source files. I will also open a uh, interactive session with Haskell with uh, GHCI. Um, GHCI is more like, um, say, a REPL in Python or in Lisp. Or if you're used to uh, a JavaScript, uh, it's comparable to the JavaScript console in a browser. Um, basically, you can enter any expression into this uh, uh, into the prompt, and it will tell you what the result is. So let's say I want to add 15 to 15. Uh, it gives back 30, which is mathematically correct. Um, if I want to concatenate the strings. I will type hello plus plus world and it will tell, uh, show the string hello world. I um, can also write an if expression, say if three is smaller than four, then write smaller, else write larger or equal for the patterns. Um, and it works, it writes smaller. So this is uh, a way to test Haskell expressions. And uh, if you want to write functions, you can do this in the interactive uh, session, but it's probably easier to write, it, write them in the source file 
and then load that source file up in the uh, in GHCI. For instance, um, let's write the sum function that we talked about earlier. Um, I'll call it my sum, and we define my sum of an empty list to be zero. Now, if I load that file up and I call my sum on an empty list, I don't have to write uh, parents around the arguments because um, calling functions is what you do in a functional language. So the less characters I need to type, the better. Um, my sum of an empty list is zero. I could try now writing my sum of one and two, but we will get an exception. It will say there, the, the patterns in function my sum aren't exhaustive. And that is true because I didn't say what to do with a non-empty list. Let's add that to my definition. My sum of a non-empty list, take the first item and the rest of the items, and then add the first item to the my sum of the rest of the list. Uh, if I now reload that file and call my sum on one and two, it will return three as expected, as hoped. Uh, if I add number three to it, it will return six. And if I only have one number in here, it will return that single number, of course. Um, so if you define functions in Haskell, you can write um, many definitions and Haskell will um, go to the first definition, see if it matches uh, with the thing you, that you call, uh, the arguments that you called it with, and then we'll go on until it finds a match. Well, let's do something more uh, uh, interesting. Um, I will uh, use the tennis kata. And um, using the, the, the tennis kata, if you've never heard of it, a kata is uh, basically a, a programming exercise that you can repeat over and over again. Um, and, and you can use it to uh, do, and you can uh, treat a problem in different ways. You can approach it um, uh, from different angles and still get to the same result, but um, go, you learn something new about it. Or you can repeat it the same way over and over again, just to um, um, get uh, comfortable with uh, the way you want to approach it. Uh, the tennis kata. Well, if you've never heard of the tennis kata, uh, don't worry. We will use this in, in this and the upcoming episodes to get more haskell -y. Um If you look it up on the web, um, you could find something like this. Um, the tennis kata is about calculating the score of a tennis game. Um, the tennis game consists of... Uh, a number of uh, balls that have been played, and a ball is the same as a round. Uh, if you've never seen tennis uh, or never played it, uh, a round consists of one player hitting the ball, and then the other player tries to hit it back, and it goes back and forth until um, the ball lands in a specific place, um, which means that one of the two players has scored, and then they scored that ball. And if you want to know what the score of the game is, you want to you have to know what the score of each ball was. And there are some rules uh, for calculating then the end game. And the rules are uh, rather simple, as this uh, site says. Um, the first rule is each player can have either of these points in one game: zero, fifteen, thirty, or forty. Um, if you have forty and you win the ball, then you win the game. But there is a special rule. If both players have 40, the players are Jews. If the game is in Jews, the winner uh, of a ball will have advantage. And if the player with advantage wins the ball, he wins the game. But if the player uh, with adv without advantage wins, so the, uh, yeah, they, they are back at Jews. What this basically means is if you uh, get to 40-40 in a game, you have to. You can only win by playing two consecutive balls and win two consecutive balls. So um, what that means is, if you in, in theory, 
if you win one ball and then the other player wins a ball and you go back and forth, the game could go on forever. So I think there should be a fourth rule stating that you can also win if one of the players just forfeits because they can't, can't hit any ball anymore. So you win by endurance. But that is not part of these rules, so we will not take this into, into account. Um, so these are the simplified rules. Um, let's see if we can implement this in Haskell. So the score of a game um, is defined by a list of ball winners. Um, we can very easily say if no ball has ever been won in this game, the score is zero for both sides. And if we try to execute that and call that function, we say, what is the score for a game in which no balls have been won? It will say zero, zero. So far, so good, very simple. Um, but what if uh, player zero, we call them zero and one, uh, what if player zero wins the ball, the first ball? Well, we can uh, easily match on that by just saying we have a single of a list with just a single element, the one, and that means player one one. And if player one one, the score is zero fifteen. And if player zero one, it's fifteen zero. So let's see if that works. What if we score an empty game, zero zero? If we score a game, player one one. 0, 15. This is very boring, I would say, pattern matching, um, but also very hard to uh, maintain or to write even because there are, as we saw, endless combinations possible in which uh, the game uh, can be scored. Uh, so what we want to do is uh, define the problem in sublists, just like the sum. And what we are going to do is say, hey, uh, if we can score this game with one, uh, we can score a small game, we can score a game and another ball. Um, so we will call some function recursively. Um, but what we do, did with the sum wouldn't, won't uh, exactly work here, because if you notice, if we call sum recursively, we skip skip the first item and then calculate the score or the sum for the rest of the list. And if we do that with a, a tennis game, we would say that the first ball, we forget forget about it and try to get a score for the rest of the game. And only then we add the first ball. But that is, of course, uh, not how tennis works. The first ball determines the first score and not the rest of the game. So we will have to uh, do something else and uh, also remember what the score so far is. Um, what we can do is uh, see what we did with the sum experience. If we say the score of an empty list is, and let's use a different notation here. Uh, at the moment, we are using a string to de denote the score. But there is also a thing in Haskell called a tuple. Um, it's also in other languages. Uh, you can just combine two numbers and write them as a single expression, a single variable. So you can have 0, 0. 0, 15, and 15, 0. And these are a bit easier to work with because if we use strings and we are going to say, hey, we know part of the game, we have a score and we want to add another ball to that score, another ball win, um, it's easier to add numbers together than to add strings together. So let's the, return the score as a tuple instead of as a uh, string. So we can say a score where no balls have been played in the game is 
zero zero. Um, wait, let's just rewrite this in the tuple form so that you can see what it looks like. So when we now say score of an empty list is zero zero, and the score of player zero winning is fifteen zero, and the score of player one winning is zero fifteen. But we want to divide this uh, solution into sub solutions, and what we can do is say, hey, if we have one single ball and we already know what the score so far is, then we can just add that single ball win to the score and see if then someone else wins. Um, but in order to do that, we have to add a uh, extra parameter to this function because we want to know what has been the score so far. Um, and we can do this um, by saying, hey, if we know what the score so far was and there are no additional balls wins, ball wins, um, we just return the score so far. If we have a sing an extra ball, we have to do something with that score. An extra ball or a list of extra balls. First we have to add that next ball to the score so far. So we will call something add score. And we have the score so far and the next winning ball. And then we score that with the rest of the balls. And we do it like this. So basically what we are uh, telling uh, the function here now is um, score will be called with two parameters now. The, the score so far, so the first time it will be zero, zero. And then the number of uh, balls that have been won. And if no balls have been won, the score so far is just uh, right, the same as the base case at my sum. But if there have been any more ball wins, then we will calculate the score so far, and we will have to write this function as well, and then call score for the new score so far and the rest of the balls. So finally, it will uh, repeat itself and recall itself until then there are no more balls, and then it will return this. So we have to add add score, and for now, well, it has two parameters: the score so far and the next ball. Let's just call it x. X. And um, say we just ignore that one and return the score so far just to be able to run this and see what happens. Um, we have to reload this. And if we call score with an empty list, it will give an error because we have to provide the score so far. It, it tells us, hey, you have to add something else. So what we are doing is score the game and start at 0, 0. The end score is 0, 0. And what if we have a winner in the first ball and it's player 0? It also returns 0, 0 because we didn't. We just ignore all the balls that are coming. Um, yes. Now what we are going to do is define what it means to add two scores together. We have a score and another player wins. What happens to the score? Well, there are only two options for who wins the ball. It's player zero or player one. So what we are going to do is uh, say we know the score for player zero we know the score for player one and say that player zero wins. In almost all cases, in the first few cases, let's say this, uh, the score will be 
15 higher for player 0 and will stay the same for player 1. And we can flip it around if player 1 wins. Of course, the score will be the stay, stay the same for player 0 and will be 15 higher for player 1. If we leave it at this, we will get some interesting scores because, of course, this only works for the first few balls. Um, let's reload this and see what happens. So we score 0-0 zero, zero, and the first player wins the first round. Player 0 wins and, yes, the score is 15-0. That's nice to see because that's the desired result. If player 1 wins, it's 0-15. What if player one wins twice consecutively? 0 30. So this looks like it's going where we want it to go. Um, if player one wins twice and then player zero wins, it's 15 30. So far, so good. The problem, however, is when a single player wins three times because then the score doesn't uh, conform to the rules anymore. 45 is not a valid, valid number of points. So we have to add some exceptions. Say, if we want to have, um, we say player zero has 30 points, we want to return 40 points for player zero if they win, not 45, um, and keep the score for player one unchanged. But if we do this, I will show you. Ah, yeah, it is. It, we already get a warning, it is not accessible, because if we um, try to score this, well, let's have player 0 win 3 times, of course, because we won't ever see what happens. We still have 45 points, because uh, even though after the first two balls the score was 30 for player 0, uh, when we add another 0, it still matches any of these because this is a wild card match and it will always match whatever happens so we have to uh, if we want to make an exception we'll have to add it above and now in this case we don't have the warning anymore so that's a good sign and if we have three scores for player zero we end up 40 15 so that is uh, what you have to do if you want to make exceptions in some matches um, of course this exception should also be there for player 1. If they have 30 points and win, player 0 score doesn't change and player 1 gets 40. But we're still not there yet. Let's reload this and test this. So this works. And the other one with player 1 winning 3 times also works now. Um, but what happens... Oh wait, we have never... Uh, told what will happen if one of both players wins. So if player 1 gets another point, they win the game. But here they will get 55 points. 55 because it doesn't match the 30. They have 40 points so far and then they will just get another 15 points because that's the base rule that we uh, defined for add score. So we will have to make an exception if player any of the players have 40 points Let's write them above here. They win the game. And how will we denote this? We have to return a tuple of uh, numbers. So let's say, um, for simplicity's sake, that uh, the winning player gets minus one. Oh, let's just give them 100 points. The winning player has 100 points and the other player automatically gets, well, whatever they had last time. It doesn't really matter. Um, when they have 100 points, the score will not change anymore after that. So um, if we play this winning game for player one, they will one have 100 points. And what Actually, what we would like to happen if they score another point, actually the rest is bogus information, should we, so we should ignore it. Uh, ignore this. So what we are going to do is add another exception. Yes, there are many exceptions in tennis rules. The exception is 
if one of the players has zero, it doesn't matter who wins. So we are going to just ignore who wins. The score stays the same. If player zero has 100 or player one has 100, it doesn't matter what happens with the scores, they will stay at 100. And player that didn't win doesn't get any more points. So from here on, the score just stays the same. See if that works. Player one wins again. Player one wins again. The score stays the same. Let's have player zero win again. So nothing happens. In the first few balls, the game has been decided and everything that happens after that doesn't change the score anymore. So now we have players that win and we see that in the result as a 100 for the player. It's not so nice, but we'll get to uh, representations of this in a later episode. We don't have too much time anymore. Um, we also have to add an exception for being juice and a player having advantage. There are still two more exceptions. And um, we can define juice. Juice, of course, is 40-40. And advantage, we can give a player 41 points. So that they win at 42 points, I guess. Um, so 40 and player one winning doesn't really, uh, 40 points and player zero winning doesn't really mean that they win the game. So that we can't just set them to 100. In another exception, which is if the other player also has 40 points. So we will not advance the score to 100, but to 41 to show they are having advantage. And the same for the other way around, they will have advantage. Then we have to add an, another exception for when one of the players is in advantage. If they then win, they have 100 points. So that's a total win for them. If the other player is in advantage, this, well, the same happens for player, player one. But if they have advantage and the other player wins, so let's switch the winning player. Player one is at uh, player zero is at advantage, but player one wins. They will go back to juice, and actually the same works here as well. So I think that we have all the rules now implemented and if we score this game of course we have to reload this oh i tried to not change the score for player one here and we cannot not change the score okay like this What did I do wrong? Ah, 40-40. Of course, player, the other player is at 40 there. There's a lot of 40s and 41s. This code really looks um, unreadable. And normally in Haskell you can write very readable code, but you would have to be able to write some types to make uh, your uh, intent explicit. Um, Okay, so let's test it. The same winning game still works, winning the game. But now let's get both players to juice. One and zero. So now they are at juice. Um, if we have player one win now, they won't win the game. They will just have advantage were they to win again, they would win the game. But would player zero win, they would be back at juice. So this happens nicely. But what if player one played the ball, the third winning ball, very uh, at the very beginning? They would already have won there and the rest wouldn't have mattered. So you can see uh, 
this is what Haskell code might look like. Again, this is, uh, this is easy to write it even more readable. And of course, returning a tuple with uh, a 100 in it or a 41, or the, it doesn't make sense in the normal rules. But we will have to, we will look into representing the score uh, in the next uh, episode. Um, but uh, when you look at it, the, the the, the definition of the rules is actually quite clear here. Um, you say um, the definition of scoring a game is taking the, the score so far and then adding the next ball to it. If there are no next balls, the score is the score of the game so far. If there are next balls, you add the next ball and repeat the process again. And what does it mean to add a ball to the score so far? Well, if any of the players, one, ignore what happened and just return the same result. If any of the players is at advantage, but the other player wins, go back to juice. If any of the players is at advantage and they win the ball, they win the game. Um, if they are at juice and a player wins, they get advantage. Actually, we are reading the rules from the description backward. Um, if any of the players win and they have 40 in a different case, they win the game. So this is the non-exception rule two. And finally, well, almost finally, if, if a player has 30 points and they win, they get 40 points. If a player has no uh, any, any different amount of points, they will get 15 points more if they win the ball. And those are the rules of tennis in a nutshell. Um, we can make this more readable and we will do this in the next episode when we are also going to look into unit testing because <clears throat> now we just tested some uh, code manually in GHCI, just call a function, see if uh, what we expect to do really happens. But next time we will see how we can automate this and write some unit tests. You might already have um, used unit tests in uh, uh, imperative languages. Of course, Haskell has no, uh, it's no exception. They can use it as well. Um, so yeah, that has been the episode so far. Let me know in the comments what uh, you think of it. If there is some uh, thing that I uh, uh, skipped over and that you would find very interesting. If you have any ideas what I could talk about in the next episode, or if I, if I made some mistakes or uh, yeah, probably made some dumb mistakes. Um, just let me know, and if you like this video, you can like it. You might also subscribe to it if you'd like. Um, there will be more episodes, and you will see uh, we are going to look into more Haskell-y things like uh, unit testing, uh, property testing, uh, type safety, and of course, things that are very specific to Haskell, uh, uh, like type classes and uh, uh, higher order functions. Well, there's lots more to come and I'm very excited to talk about it. So I hope to see you next time when we will take some more small Haskell steps. Goodbye.